As a broken clock once said, Speaking out against abuse fetishists, pedophiles, and bigots in your fan base will always be better in the long run than being quiet or complacent. It might be exhausting to deal with, but it's better for everyone in the long run. So speak out I shall. Though before we can get to that, I just need to give a content warning for the following topics. Sexual assault, child abuse, child sexual assault, grooming, incest, gaslighting, victim blaming, and queer phobia. I also need to give you some background as to the pony community here on YouTube. My Little Pony is a Hasbro toy line which, similar to Transformers, was released alongside a reoccurring TV show designed to promote and sell merchandise to children. However, with the release of Friendship is Magic in 2010, My Little Pony went from generic girl toy line to cultural force. This resulted in a number of YouTube personalities, mostly adult fans of the show, amassing huge followings by discussing the media and its various themes, lessons, and characters. Now by the time we arrive in 2015, said lineup included Josh Scorcher, aka Commander Firebrand, Lily Orchard, and Ink Rose, the three of whom worked together at the time and were considered a power trio. Though I should note that Ink Rose and Lily mostly interacted through Josh. Lily was also a fan of something known as Fire Rose, a shipping name that combined the names of Commander Firebrand and Ink Rose. In fact, she was such a fan of their ship that this led an anonymous user to ask her why on Tumblr, a question she answered with, You want the real reason or the funny reason? Screw it, I'll give you both. Funny reason. Young Republicans who embody the kind-hearted nature that genuine family values are supposed to embody and are the spitting image of that homey American family with very few of the modern drawbacks, they are likely the very last of their kind. I'm pretty sure there are zoologists out there who are legally obligated to try and get them to breed. Real reason. The two of them have the exact same values, the exact same traditions, and the exact same virtues and vices. That's not just a silly ship. I actually said to Josh that he and Inkros were practically made for each other. And if this ship becomes canon, I will have the most smug I told you so face in the history of smug I told you so faces. But she's underage. She won't be for very long. Also, I wrote a book where a 15 year old ran off with a 38 year old and you all thought it was lovely. So let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Is conked on the head by a rock. Ow. Damn it, Josh. A post which only survives today, thanks to Josh having reposted it on the 3rd of August 2015, adding that, quote, I have no witty continuation for this. This is just funny. End quote. For those that don't know, a Pony OC, that's original character, like Commander Firebrand, is an extension of the individual, same as a fursona in the furry fandom. This is why Lily justifies her shipping on the basis of Josh and Rose's values as people, rather than the values of their characters. She is genuinely shipping them as people, whilst using the language of fiction to soften her words. The problem of which is, both Josh and Lily were 23 years old at the time this was posted. That means they had, at the very least, 6 years on Ink Rose, a significant age difference when one of those people is also a minor. Now I understand the need for a close in-range exemption for the age of consent, because even if a minor were to date someone from the same year as them, unless they were born on the same day, one would age out before the other. And it's often viewed as being perfectly reasonable to have an age difference of one to two years when you're a minor, as there's not much difference in power between, say, a 17 year old and a 16 and 15 year old. That said, you couldn't say the same for a romantic relationship between a 17 year old and an 11 year old. There is a clear imbalance there. And the same goes for dealing with minors dating adults. There was a chasm of six years between Josh and Rose, and yet Lily felt it appropriate to downplay the fact that Ink Rose was underage as she genuinely pushed for them to enter a romantic relationship on the basis of their real-world values. So with that issue made clear, let's begin to unpack this post, starting with the fact that this was no joke, because in spite of the inevitable protest of people who would try to pretend that it was, 
Lily is very clear in telling us the exact opposite. She gives us her satirical take on the whole situation before giving us her very disturbing and yet very genuine thoughts on the two of them dating. So right off the bat, if Lily wants to say that she's not joking on a matter as serious as grooming a minor, only to go ahead and get mad when people take what she says seriously, the only person she can blame is herself. Her job is communication. This is what she does for a living. That said, some people might turn to the slapstick as an argument that both responses were a joke. So I'd ask you to consider the focus of the slapstick. It's not the relationship that Lily is pushing for. The focus is on people's criticism of her forwarding that relationship, specifically the fact that one of the people involved is underage. It's intended to defang the accusation of grooming by presenting it as a joke, something to be laughed at as she continues to ship an adult with a minor. Through her posturing, Lily is presenting grooming as this quirky thing that some people personally dislike, rather than abusive behaviour that needs to be dealt with. Yet sadly, this is not by any means the only method Lily is reliant on when it comes to downplaying her actions. Consider the she won't be for long remark that Lily deploys in response to someone hypothetically mentioning Ink Rose's underage. This is a quintessential example of the jailbait wait, a media trope in which a character waits for their love interest to reach the age of consent, being applied in real life. Now, the problem with this perspective is that it lacks a fundamental understanding of what grooming is and how it works. Child grooming is not the act of sexually assaulting minors. It refers to a series of methods designed to dismantle the defences a minor has in preparation for sexual assault, a large part of which is the normalisation of the act, whether it be through slowly exposing a minor to touching or downplaying the horror behind encouraging a minor to engage in a relationship with an adult. And that grooming does not vanish the moment a person turns 18. This is why vertical incest, incest between someone and their parents, aunts and uncles or grandparents, is so wrong. Because even if a person is over the age of 18, they've grown up with these people having authority over them. This is why feminists took issue with Jacob imprinting on a literal fucking infant in the Twilight Saga. Because even if you were to wait for that minor to become an adult, the power imbalance that had existed prior to her reaching that age would have continued to impact their relationship. The same is true for Josh and Ink Rose. Another method Lily utilises is implicating her audience in her actions, reminding them that she wrote a book where a 15 year old ran off with a 38 year old and you all thought it was lovely. She's making out that it's in her audience's best interest to defend her as she offers up a real minor for grooming. Because condemning real life grooming raises the possibility that condoning fictional grooming is also unacceptable. There's also a sense of gradual commitment being used here to pull her audience further along by appealing to their human desire for consistency. Psychology has shown us that it's not only possible, but actually very easy to get someone who would consider themselves a morally upstanding person to commit horrific acts if approached in the right manner. The go-to example of this being the Milgram experiments that showed us how upward of 60% of US citizens were capable of being pushed to murder someone that they just met if gradually eased into things. So it's very conceivable for someone who would have rejected the jump from child grooming is not okay to child grooming is okay to go from child grooming is not okay to child grooming in fiction is okay and then go on further to child grooming is okay. Even though the excuse given for child grooming in fiction namely that it involves fictional characters, is mutually exclusive with the argument given later. Lily has created an intermediary, which she then uses to demand consistency, giving her a very strong psychological lever. 
Now I was shocked when Levi pointed out this appeal to consistency because it actually supports Psych I've discussed in relation to the dangers of fictional child porn. Psych I've been big on is not over focusing on the possibility that fictional child porn creates new predators, since the science on that is inconclusive. Instead, I focus on how it grooms minors into thinking that them being sexualized is normal, harms survivors of childhood sexual assault by triggering them, creates communities in which predators can hide and form rank, and lastly, the way in which it normalizes the act of grooming and even child sexual assault in the eye of the public. And it's that last one we're seeing here. Lily is very consciously using her own child rape fanfics to normalize the real life act of grooming in her audience's mind. On top of this, her language of you all thought it was lovely is her constructing a public, one of Lily's favorite rhetorical methods. When she says this, she's signaling to all of her fans who weren't okay with this, or more likely didn't know about it, that they're alone. And since Lee has made it her job to publicly abuse people, particularly members of her own audience for any number of arbitrary reasons, nobody is going to go from fan to fan asking how they really feel about the matter. I cannot overstate just how afraid many of her own audience is of approaching her, even to tell her about stuff that wasn't their fault, because they know there's a high probability that they will be publicly dragged for it. And because we're a social species predisposed to conform, it's much easier to just nod your head and accept what Lily says to be true, establishing her as the arbiter of truth. And this feeds back into the gradual commitment, since one component of ensuring the success of gradual commitment is having the person responsible appear to be an authority. The way this was done in the Milgram experiments was through the appearance of science. The people giving the orders to steadily increase the voltage were dressed in white lab coats and stationed in laboratories. Though, when it comes to Lily, she doesn't need all that, since she's cultivated this false impression of a public in which everyone thinks like her. That's why she never feels the need to source any of her assertions, because her word is taken as law. Lastly, we come to her satirical quip about Josh and Ink being endangered animals who need to be bred in order to survive. Even though this is clearly part of a joke, it sets the tone for the rest of her post. She is not simply talking about a romantic relationship, she is talking about sex. That's why Lily follows this up with the fact that Ink Rose is underage in her serious answer. What's more is, we don't typically think of animals as being able to consent. That's a framework that just doesn't exist in our minds. Instead, which zoo animals are bred together is chosen by a team of caretakers. So, by making that comparison, Lily is stripping away the framework of consent as it applies to ink rows. This post is Lily not only normalizing grooming, but statuary rape as well. So it is thoroughly fucked up. However, it's still only a small part of the picture. We also have to consider things beyond this post, including the fact that Fire Rose was a fandom-wide phenomenon. Hell, in 2014, Josh and Ink appeared in a video together hosted by Dr. Wolf, in which they talked about themselves as a couple. Now, some people may be quick to argue that this whole thing has been blown out of proportion since the top comment on that video is Ink Rose explaining that their relationship is strictly fictional. But here's the thing. Enough people thought that the relationship between an adult and a minor was genuine, that this had to be clarified. That's how much the lines were already blurred by this point, that people were genuinely having difficulty telling which parts were real and which parts were pretend. And it's at that point that Liddy came along and argued that Fire Rose should be more than fiction, that Josh and Ink should have a very real, romantic, and even sexual relationship. That blurring laid the groundwork for more severe forms of grooming 
and every adult who was present at the time is responsible for that. Can we imagine what being in that situation must have been like for Ink Rose? Imagine the immense pressure placed on her to engage in a potentially sexual relationship with an adult by an entire community. A community she not only belongs to, but works within. Many of the people pushing this are those she likely respects as fellow creators, making it very difficult to ignore what it is they're saying. Add in the fact that many of them are adults, a group she's been used to listening to and assuming know best for her entire life. She's likely been threatened or punished for defying the adults in her life, both at school and at home. Even if she's never really come into contact with that dynamic, that's likely because she understands the power imbalance between a child and an adult, and is someone who has followed instructions without much fuss in the past. So, either way, she's at a clear disadvantage as she doesn't really have the power to protect herself or self-advocate. As a minor, she's also likely had very little, if any, experience with relationships, romantic or sexual. Combine that with the peer pressure coming from an entire community and the inability to properly self-advocate, being confronted with all that would have been incredibly intimidating for her. If she put a foot wrong in the eyes of those pushing fire rows, she's not only faced with the prospect of being ostracized by her community, but reprimanded by various adults. And if you don't believe me, consider that it almost worked. Ink Rose went on a real life date with Josh at some point, after years of being groomed and pressured into doing so as a minor. And it very well could have continued if Josh hadn't started dating someone else in 2017. And before someone says that this is reference to his character Firebrand, not Josh as a person, just look at that Team Fortress roleplay. No, he actually got engaged to Ari in 2018, and the two later married. In light of that, I have no reason to think the relationship stuff in this paragraph is roleplay. Ink Rose was groomed by an entire fandom, some of whom went further in that regard than others, and she barely avoided becoming trapped. But this will still have a lasting impact on how she as a person engages with others around her, because that psych like dismantling a person's defences will cause. For example, it makes a person more susceptible to future abuse. Whilst the term grooming is typically limited to child grooming, at least in a legal context, the methods used can help us understand how people such as domestic abusers can control their victims through a means of adult grooming. After all, they both share common themes of normalization through gradual exposure, isolation, gaslighting, etc. And it's much easier to do these things if someone has already done part of the work for you. That's why re-victimization is so common when it comes to things like abuse and sexual assault. Because the victim now has those defenses eroded on a deep psychological level. Something which requires massive amounts of time and support to repair. Sadly, many people don't have access to either. And that's something predators are very often very good at picking up on. But it goes even further than that, since Ink Rose was not the only minor exposed to all this grooming. Every single child who was part of the MLP YouTube community and saw this unfurl is also a victim. They were constantly exposed to a minor being pressured into engaging in a romantic relationship with an adult, one that was indistinguishable from the real thing, to the point that Ink Rose had to publicly clarify. This is the normalization mentioned earlier, but on an industrial scale. This is parasocial grooming, allowing for an entire audience to have their defenses disabled. Yet, what's rather scary about this entire thing is that our laws aren't equipped to handle parasocial grooming. But, as history has gone to show us, legal does not mean ethical. And we haven't even considered the impact this will have in how young people perceive success in the MLP fandom, in how they might draw a connection between dating an adult pony YouTuber and success. Because whilst Ink Rose clearly worked hard to establish herself, 
There's no doubt that Fire Rose helped both her and Josh grow their audiences. So it's not just normalization, there's a potential lure involved. The proverbial candy inside the van. Now I need to be clear in that I don't hold Ink Rose the slightest bit responsible for this in any way. As a minor, it was not her responsibility to put an end to things, but it was that of the adults around her. Yet instead of stepping forward to do the right thing, every adult creator seemed set on promoting, accommodating, or simply turning away and ignoring the issue. And in doing that, they all became responsible for mass child grooming via parasocial relationships. Which brings me to my last point, how the sort of behaviour is self-replicating. If enough adults seem okay with grooming, going along with it or even downplaying the harm caused, that teaches other adults to do the same, since adults are not immune to conformity. And this is true whether or not a person is a predator themselves, because, to be clear, I don't believe everyone wrapped up in this is a predator. Except for Josh. They're simply aiding and abetting predatory behaviour. And as a self-replicating system, the problem only gains more momentum the longer it's allowed to exist. Like a runaway train, we seriously need to derail. And Lily is at the head of it. What makes her particularly dangerous is how she's presenting herself as being anti-pedophile. As shown at the start, Lily is walking around claiming to be a bastion of safety for groomed minors and victims of childhood sexual assault. The result of which is pre-groomed children, children who are especially vulnerable for the same reasons as touched upon in regards to ink rows, are being funneled towards Lily. Which is a problem, since whilst I hold off declaring everyone involved a predator, most of them simply being willing to accommodate and defend them, I am almost certain Lily is. Lily not only has a history of encouraging the grooming of minors, which is a style of grooming in itself, normalising it, but she constantly grooms the minors in her own audience via exposure to sexually explicit content, both on her Tumblr and in her streams to this day. This is not a one-off, this is a pattern of behaviour spread over an entire decade, and in many ways only becoming worse. And so we will be covering the ways in which she grooms minors in her own audience in a second video, before we finally head on to assess Lily's philosophy when it comes to child rape, carrying out a textual analysis of the Stockholm series with comparisons to both Tale of the Valkyrie and Pokey Madhouse. Because Lily is not who she pretends to be. Though I'd like to wrap up with a message, not to Lily, but those that support her. If you donate money to her, if you share her work in an uncritical manner, if you encourage others to watch her, this is what you are enabling and supporting. Regardless of your intentions, you have been aiding and abetting a paedophile, and the consequences of that have been far-reaching. So do the right thing. Stop supporting her and help make others aware of the dangers she poses. Help fix the damage you had a hand in creating. If you have any questions or criticism, do post them down below. Just know that abuse won't make it through. If you appreciate what we do here on the channel, do know you can support us via Patreon. While this video is being monetized, this is solely to boost its position in the algorithm, since it's important that this information gets out there. Any AdSense money the video makes will be donated to a charity related to the topic, so Patreon remains our only source of income, allowing us to keep the channel running. On that note, we'd like to thank the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soren Katie, Keynes, Cthulhu, Gert Van Voorst, Steve Corbin, Sosh Daniels, and Justin Allen. And for myself, Udita and Levi, take care now.